everybody. Um, I am Alan Kawaguchi, Alpine Orthopedic Medical Group. Uh, thank you all for coming this, uh, joining us on this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm the Chief of Orthopedic Section at St. Joseph's, and I will talk a little bit about a uh, topic that's uh, a passion of mine, and that's knee osteoarthritis treatment in 2020. And I'd like to thank St. Joseph's for giving me the opportunity to, opportunity to give this talk this evening. Okay, so the objectives here, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about knee anatomy and the pathology, which is what goes wrong. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, non-operative treatment, non-surgical treatment that is, key medical parameters to be a good candidate for surgery, reasons for needing a total, total or partial knee replacement surgery, and what's going on recently in the computer age in terms of knee replacement surgery. So starting off, um, I'll discuss the anatomy of the knee. As you can see from this diagram here, uh, this is a knee that's opened up, and uh, the top bone here is the femur bone. The knee is bent at 90 degrees, so you don't see the rest of the femur bone. Um, but as you can see behind this white area is the yellow area, and that's, what the bone, uh, that's the bone. And then the lower section here, this is your tibia bone, your shin bone. And you can see this area is, is, is yellow, and that's what bone looks like. Bone itself is rather rough. Uh, it's not very smooth. But, when, uh, but at the end of the bone, where the joint is made, there's a covering called the cartilage. Cartilage is a material that's about an eighth of an inch thick in the knee on both sides. Uh, and normally, this is white and glistening, and it's uh, uh, pretty sturdy and durable. On the tibia, there's also uh, about one eighth inch layer of this cartilage that uh, 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 helps to create the joint. Now, in between, obviously, there are tissues such as ligaments and there's something called the meniscus that sits between the uh, femur bone and the, and, the, and the tibia bone, and that's sort of the cushion or shock absorber, if you will, uh, of the knee. Uh, and if you look down here, this is a, uh, the knee cap, we call it the patella. Uh, and you can see there's a ridge in the middle, and this ridge actually will uh, seat right in, the, in this little groove right here when the knee is working properly. And there's cartilage on this too. And so that's basically what the normal knee looks like. And arthritis is a condition where this uh, cartilage starts to degrade, where initially it gets thin uh, to the point where you may start seeing the bone uh, showing through. And, and when that happens, uh, in, in that process, the knee can start hurting. And that's why most people come to see me. So this is probably the only gross picture I have. So if anyone is, is, is a, a little queasy, please turn your head just for this slide. But this, I, I couldn't find a better slide than this, but this one really shows what happens when the knee is opened up. So on the right hand here, a lot of this is good cartilage. It's a little off-white colored. Um, and it looks very smooth, although there's a little small crater right here. That's what arthritis is. On the left-hand side here, you can see these little craters or spots that look a little abnormal. And that's where the uh, arthritis has set in, where uh, the surface becomes rougher and the bone starts showing through. This ovoid area here is actually an area where the car cartilage has all eroded away and that you're actually looking at the bone right here. Okay, and uh, when this bone uh, uh, is exposed, and on, I can't see the bone on the tibia, but when the bone is exposed and there's bone rubbing against bone, uh, that's, what, that's what arthritis is, and that's what causes the pain. In addition, you can see these little bumps right here, these little uh, bumps here and these little bumps here, okay? Those are abnormal as well. Those are called bone spurs, if you will, okay? Bone spurs in and of themselves don't hurt. They just are a manifestation of the arthritic process. And this is the kneecap, uh, the patella. And again, you can see there's an area here that has some wear of the cartilage and there's some craters. So this is what happens when the knee becomes arthritic. You start getting these craters to form. Sometimes they're shallow, then they get deeper. And then uh, two of them start connecting to each other. And as the cartilage go, uh, wears away, you end up with a large, potentially a large area where the cartilage is denuded. And that can uh, cause pain, obviously. Okay. so. When someone comes to my office, uh, I get x-rays uh, to see what the condition of the knee is. You don't need to get a CAT scan. You really don't need to get an MRI. Uh, a plain x-ray standing up will do. 
So this is a frontal view. We call it the AP view, a frontal view of uh, right knee. And you can see this uh, shadow of this uh, of the kneecap right there in the center. Okay, but as you can see here, this is someone standing up. So this is not air here between the top bone and the bottom bone. There's actually the cartilage that lives in this area here. Okay, and uh, as you can see, when someone's standing up with that, with uh, out arthritis, there's what we call a space. That's because cartilage is not seen on X-ray. It's a uh, uh, it's invisible. So it looks like the top bone is floating on the bottom bone, but technically it's not. There's cartilage that lives here. And typically when you measure it, it's about a quarter inch space here, and it should be equal amount on the other side as well. And notice if you look at the bone uh, edges, they look rather smooth. So this is a really a normal, healthy knee. As opposed to this picture on the right side here, this is a very arthritic knee. Notice on the inner side of the knee here, on, on the right side, this is the inner side of the knee. You can see that the bone is rubbing against bone. Why? Because the cartilage has been, you know, uh, uh, eroded away. As opposed to maybe the outside portion here um, of the knee, you can still see that there's space there. So there's probably cartilage left over there. But as you can see, uh, there's some rough edges. Those bone spurs that I talked to you about earlier, they start to form. And again, the bone spurs themselves don't hurt. They're just a, another uh, manifestation of your arthritis saying that, okay, there are some things that you, you find when you get an arthritic knee. So, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, origin of the word arthritis. So it's, 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 uh, it comes from two Greek uh, uh, parts. Arthro in Greek is a, is a, is a root for joint, and itis uh, means inflammation or pain. Now, a little bit about uh, inflammation. A lot of people don't understand what inflammation is. Now, inflammation causes pain, but what is actually, what exactly is inflammation? Well, it's a condition uh, in which a uh, part of the body becomes red, swollen, hot, and painful. Um, and this is actually the body's process of fighting against things that harm it in an attempt to heal itself. So your body releases chemicals that trigger a response from the immune system. And this response can include release of antibodies, proteins, uh, and other uh, chemicals. And it also increases the blood flow or circulation to that part of the body that the body is trying to heal. Um, an example would be if you got punched hard in your arm uh, before it becomes black and blue, you might find it to get red, swollen, may get warm, uh, and it's painful. And then and your body is basically bringing in uh, 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 proteins and such cells to try to repair that damage. So that's what inflammation is. And unfortunately, inflammation leads to pain. Okay, um, in terms of arthritis, there's different reasons uh, why a joint becomes arthritic. Uh, the most common one is called osteoarthritis. More than 50% of the time, that's the kind of arthritis that people have. I would say more, more close to 75 or 80% of the time. And this is from general wear and tear, okay? You know, unfortunately, as we all get older, um, the, the, everything degrades in our body. Um, and so I always tell patients, if you are able to live long enough, you probably will end up getting some degree of arthritis in your knees or other joints uh, that you use for 80, 100 years or what have you. Um, so that's your general wear and tear uh, uh, process. Um, another reason uh, for getting arthritis is after some injury, maybe 20 years before, 10 years, we had a fairly significant injury, a break, a fracture, or some uh, major injury in, in the knee that you have to have some type of surgery for. We call that post-traumatic arthritis. It's somewhat of a subset of the osteoarthritis, but some people classify it as a different type of arthritis because as the arthritis perhaps have a, has a, a, a sped up, accelerated because of the trauma you've had in the past. Other reasons for arthritis include inflammatory types, people that uh, may have heard the term rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus, or gout. Uh, this is caused by a dysfunction, a malfunction, in the, usually in the immune system in your body that leads to inflammation again that uh, that can uh, erode the uh, cartilage and uh, uh, lead to the arthritis. Uh, and then there are other rare congenital hereditary uh, causes for having arthritis, but we're not going to touch on that today. Okay, so then we need to decide what's the right treatment, okay? People come into my office and they ask me, what can I, what can I do for this arthritis once I explain to them what arthritis is? Obviously, there is a conservative treatment, and then it goes up to the surgical. So 
if you have bad enough arthritis, you know, you may ask, or well, why not go, you know, uh, not beat around the bush and why not go immediately, immediately to surgery? Well, obviously surgery has risks. General risks include infection, nerve damages, anesthesia risks, blood clots on legs, uh, and other uh, unforeseen complications that can happen. Now, these are all, luckily, they're, 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 the percentages are very small, but if you get any of these, especially an infection, it could be a, a significant life changer. So obviously, surgery, we know, has risks. The other thing uh, is when you replace a knee, you know, there's only a, sh uh, a certain uh, uh, amount of shelf life that's, uh, 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 that exists for a knee replacement. Uh, even in 2020, uh, we tell patients that if you take good care of the replaced knee, uh, there's about 90, 80 to 90 percent chance that it'll last you 15 to 20 years. I mean, some people may have it longer. Some people may, it may fail earlier for different reasons. Uh, but that's that's the general uh, uh, what research has has shown us. The idea is try to take the one having the uh, joint replaced once. And then you know take it with you to the next world uh, without having to have a redo. We call those revisions. Revisions are uh, always harder technically because there's scar tissue there we have to go through, and the results uh, for uh, the patients are not as good uh, because it's a redo of something that was done the first time. Um, therefore, we actually uh, uh, try to uh, uh, convince younger patients usually less than 50 to 55 years old to hold off uh, on having uh, this type of surgery until you're a little, a little older. If you ex uh, say that the average life expectancy of someone in America is let's, let's say roughly 80, uh, you know, if you have surgery at age 50 or 55, uh, you know, there's a high chance you're gonna need a redo sometime in your lifetime. So that's where I, uh, doctors may tell you you're too young to have surgery, but that's, kind of, that's the reason. Uh, as opposed to your own cartilage in your knee, uh, you know, God gave us uh, joints to last 80 to uh, 90 years if, if you take good care of them. There are a lot of people that are in their 80s, 90s who will never need knee surgery. They may have some arthritis uh, because we all get it, but uh, it may not be as bad where they may end up needing a knee replacement. So you can't beat the, what the human body uh, has. Okay. Um, so let's talk about treatment options here. Conservative meaning non-operative options, uh, if, especially if you have moderate or not as severe arthritis, the things that you can do uh, to help uh, either slow down the uh, degree of arthritis or help with inflammation. And that includes low impact aerobic exercises, such as walking on a treadmill or just walking in general. Uh, if, if gyms are open, you can use machines like uh, the uh, uh, elliptical machine, um, uh, and again, treadmill. Um, and then there are other uh, exercises you can do that helps with strengthening parts of the body. Uh, uh, balance, uh, uh, exercises that are good for balance and, and agility training. Um, basically, if you think about why that's important, every time you trip and fall or trip and stumble, you are damaging, uh, you know, even if it's at a little small microscopic level, you are causing damage to a joint. So you want to try to uh, uh, avoid those as much as possible, those uh, episodes. And then by, by strengthening uh, your, your, your body, uh, you can hopefully reduce the number of times you're going to be tripping and falling. Um, another important uh, uh, conservative treatment option is diet and weight loss. People always ask me, what can I do to uh, slow down the arthritis because you can't stop it. Uh, and the one that's been shown over and over in research is actually, you know, uh, being on a good diet and losing weight. And it kind of makes sense. The heavier uh, one is, uh, the more uh, pressure that the knee joint or, or whatever needs to uh, uh, hold up. So um, there's a lot of pressure there, and that certainly can uh, wear away the cartilage a lot faster when you're heavier. Uh, Bracing, uh, some people uh, 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 like using braces because it makes them feel like it gets some support. Uh, the research has not shown that bracing 100% works very well, but I never, I never dissuade a person from getting a brace if they, if they really want one. And, and there's no one brace that's better than another. So I always tell my patients, if you want to try one, just go get one over the counter uh, at the, at the uh, sporting goods store and try and see if you like it. If you don't like it, then you know uh, that's fine. 
Uh, physical therapy can be ben uh, beneficial in a lot of cases. Again, this kind of goes, uh, ties in with the upper portion here about you know, aerobic exercise or strengthening and balance. You go to physical therapy and they could teach you exercises to do to help you maintain the strength and balance uh, or agility that you need. Uh, some people uh, uh, feel that acupuncture may uh, help with the pain portion of it. It's not going to slow down the arthritis, we think, but and uh, Western medicine uh, doesn't really know, uh, understand much about how acupuncture works, but certainly it's been around in the Eastern uh, 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 culture for a long time. And therefore, uh, if someone asks me about acupuncture, I always tell them I don't have much experience with it, but there are some people that seem to get good relief from it. Okay, now uh, those are things that are, are fairly simple to do without uh, involving medications. Well, so what about medications? Well, the number one type of medication, if uh, you're able to take it, are called the NSAIDs or the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, uh, both oral and topical. The oral ones that are available over the counter uh, include ibuprofen and naproxen. Now, ibuprofen is just a generic name for Advil and Motrin. Um, and then you have Aleve, which is a generic name for naproxen. Those are about the only ones that are available over the counter, oh, except for aspirin or aspirin products. Excedrin and all of those are offshoots of aspirin, which is the traditional NSAID. There is one topical over-the-counter medication that's currently now available. It's called diclofenac gel or Voltaren gel. It used to be by prescription, uh, but as of February of this year, it became over-the-counter. So you can get that uh, gel, and some people get relief from it. Uh, I don't think it's as strong as an ibuprofen pill or, or naproxen or leaf pill, but for those that get stomach problems, uh, it's something that perhaps is worth a try. Uh, and that's actually different from taking pain medication. Tylenol or acetaminophen is actually a pain medication. Okay, it's not addictive, it's considered a pain medication. Um, besides doing other things, Tylenol can certainly uh, be a good pain reliever. All right, um, and uh, one uh, a word of advice, uh, for arthritic pain, you really wanna try to avoid opiates. Opiates are like codeine or Vicodin or Norco or Percocet. You want to avoid opiates when you have arthritic pain. Why? Because they are addictive. Um, and this is, these are the type of medications you want to take right around the time of surgery or right after surgery to relieve your pain. If you're already taking opiates before surgery, uh, there's a high chance that uh, uh, pain medication are not going to be as effective uh, at that time when you really need it for after surgery. Uh, if you are on it uh, beforehand. Now, obviously there are some exceptions, but that's just a general rule of thumb. Injections can also be very helpful in an arthritic uh, uh, knee. Cortisones, corticosteroids or cortisone, uh, there's different varieties, um, can be very helpful. Now, unfortunately, we don't know how long they last for in each individual. Sometimes, in some individuals, they may last three years. Some people uh, may say they get relief for three months. Uh, some people was only three days. Um, given all that, uh, the research has shown that on average, that means some people say you know, three days, some people say three months, the average uh, length of time that cortisone lasts in, in your need to give you effective pain relief is about a month. Okay. Now, a lot of people are worried about uh, cortisone causing damage to tissue. Now, that is true if you have cortisol linger in that particular joint long enough. In other words, if you get repeated injections over and over too soon, uh, what's too soon? Uh, you know, every week, every month, or thereabouts, that's too soon. So we, as orthopedic surgeons, tell patients, we think it's safe. The studies have shown it's safe if you limit it to about three to four a year. That comes out to maybe once every three to four months, or if you could wait longer, the better, but uh, no sooner than that. Uh, hyaluronic acid injections are another type of injections that can be considered in, in some patients. Hyaluronic acid, the, there are brand names that people may be more familiar with, uh, include Synvisc, Genvisc, Orthovisc, uh, Gelson. Um, there's a few out there, Hy um, Hyalgan, that some, uh, some uh, of, uh, of patients may have heard of or tried. Um, and in some patients, these can help. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, research is not perfect on these injections, partly because we still don't understand exactly how they uh, relieve pain in the knee joint. Uh, 
but also uh, uh, whether or not they really work or not, or is there a placebo effect? Because of that, there are a couple of uh, insurance, commercial insurances that, that have basically denied or have said that they won't pay for these injections anymore. Um, but uh, they, they're still available for a large majority of patients uh, as a potential uh, uh, therapeutic agent uh, uh, that's uh, uh, considered a, a medication. The last two uh, uh, entities that I'll touch on are PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, or stem cells. There's a lot of press, uh, a lot of news, and uh, a lot of uh, press out there regard about either these two types of uh, uh, potential um, uh, treatment options. Um, unfortunately, uh, although they're FDA approved, uh, there are no good studies as to uh, what's considered uh, the right amount uh, or how well they work. The research is still uh, being worked out. Because of that, insurances you know, don't generally pay for these. Uh, uh, treatment options. There are uh, cash-based uh, treatments um, that some places charge, you know, in the thousands. Uh, and whether or not they work or not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's still somewhat uh, controversial. Certainly, the worse arthritis you have, bone on bone, less likely to work. Uh, the more milder arthritis cases, I think patients may have better chance of them working in. But uh, that's a little uh, spiel to be complete on uh, PRP and stem cells. This is the funny slide that I found. Um, so hopefully, maybe uh, not in my lifetime, but maybe 100 years from now, we'll get to the point where uh, these uh, stem cells and PRP, gene therapy, what have you, uh, will help regenerate the cartilage. We can't do that in 2020 yet. This is just a cartoon where there's a bunch of kids at a museum showing them a scalpel up on a uh, stand here saying that, you know, back in the day, this is what surgeons used to use to cut people and fix things and everyone's in amazement but unfortunately in 2020 uh the only way to fix knee arthritis is still using the uh, uh scalpel all right so now i'm going to talk a little bit about knee surgery uh and the surgical options that that uh, we have for uh, um, uh, uh, uh an arthritic knee okay um some people may uh, i've had some patients come and ask me what about arthroscopy in other words uh, doctor, can't you just go in and clean out the arthritis in my knee? And the answer is that research has been done several times, and the studies have shown that this really does not work to relieve pain in the long term. It may help for a month or so, but it's basically, you know, just still just uh, delaying the inevitable. So we don't go in and clean out the knee, uh, uh, clean out the arthritis uh, per se, uh, if you just have pain in the knee. It doesn't really work. So what are the reasons for needing knee replacement surgery? Well, the primary reason that patients come in is due to pain, right? Everyone has pain and want to get rid of the pain. And at secondarily, there's stiffness. And certainly the x-rays uh, uh, need to show that the, the joint is arthritic, right? And that's when we start doing knee replacement surgery. OK. Uh, a word about medical parameters to be a good candidate. Uh, you know, not everyone is, I call it, eligible or qualifies to have surgery. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that your heart's in good condition, and most people do. If you're a cardiologist, uh, uh, if you have a heart condition, most, car most of the time the cardiologist will check you out and make sure that your heart is optimized to have surgery. Doesn't mean that you can't have surgery, but if you have a bad heart, you may have a higher risk uh, to have complications, but it's always, a, you know, there's a risk-benefit uh, analysis that, can, that, that, that needs to be done. Uh, diabetes is a, is a very... Uh, um, um, uh, uh, crucial topic that uh, we need to address uh, as surgeons uh, before we do what's called elective surgery, right? Um, if your sugars are not controlled and you're diabetic, there's a higher chance of having an infection. And I uh, alluded to earlier, when you get, if you were to get an infection, that could be a very devastating uh, 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 problem. It could call, lead to more disability and problems than what you started off with without having surgery. So uh, one thing we need to have is good control of your diabetes. And there is a uh, test called the hemoglobin A1C that a lot of patients are, are now knowing about and getting more educated on. It's a better, uh, 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 it's a test that uh, really uh, gives the uh, more accurate uh, uh, um, analysis of how well your blood sugars are being controlled over the past three months. 
one could still uh, say, oh, doctor, my sugar has been about 110 or 105 for the past two days, but uh, that person may forgot the fact that their sugars were running 175, 180 two weeks ago. But the hemoglobin A1C, we really can't cheat this test because it's an, about an, it's an average of approximately what happened in the last three months. Uh, and uh, this uh, test uh, ranges somewhere between five and usually 10 or even higher, but we, we really want your uh, hemoglobin A1C to be less than eight. Uh, some doctors will even say, we, we like to see it below 7.5. But uh, if someone comes in with a level around nine or 10, that means you're not really controlling your sugars well. Uh, and certainly that's also bad on uh, your, your health in general. So we like to get that to under control with your primary care doctor. Uh, being overweight uh, is also a high risk factor for having such surgery. Now, there, obviously there is a, a spectrum of what's considered overweight. Uh, we use a scale called the body mass index is basically a ratio of your weight to your height. And we, need to, we like to have this number less than 40 for the most part. There are some institutions in the, in the country and in the state that, uh, uh, or even some insurance companies that may say, we're not gonna authorize it, uh, the surgery unless your BMI is less than a certain number. But 40 is probably the upper limit uh, that uh, uh, we use. Although these are all guidelines and not that you can't have surgery, uh, but, uh, um, and some doctors will still do the surgery if your body mass index is higher, but you have to understand that uh, you, you run the risk of having more complications. The more tissue you have around your knee joint, the heavier you are, the more tissue you're gonna have around your knee joint, higher chance of having technical issues, uh, higher chance of having uh, more complications, whether it's uh, in the surgery uh, with a, a bleeding or, or infection risk or afterwards. Again, you're heavy, so you have this uh, uh, implant that's in your body, that can wear out uh, faster if you're heavy. Okay, so I wanna go over uh, some expectations that uh, one should have after knee replacement surgery. Now, this kind of varies, uh, but you know we're heading towards the uh, uh, time when we're not keeping people in the, in the hospital uh, for any length of time anymore. COVID is one thing, but even before COVID, there are a lot of places in the United States that are getting patients in and out of the hospital the same day. So my, I tell my patients, you know, the plan is to have you go home the same day. Sometimes spend one night in the hospital if, if someone has a lot of medical problems, uh, like kidney failure or, or in, in addition to a bad heart and so on, we may keep you overnight. But in general, we like patients to try to get home the same day. And having said that, about 90% of patients go home from the hospital. No more rehab, no uh, you know, uh, uh, extended care facility, uh, you will get better care if you go home. Uh, oftentimes we will, uh, may set up a uh, home physical therapy, although that's still controversial, controversial as well, whether that really helps or not. It's almost better to just go to an out uh, physical therapist's office and get uh, therapy there as opposed to having someone come to your home. But uh, uh, one of the risk factors of going to a rehab center uh, is that uh, there's a lot of patients that end up getting un unintended problems such as pneumonias or uh, bladder infections. Uh, because if you think about it, people that go to these, uh, what you call them nursing facilities or rehab facilities, a lot of them are there because they had a pneumonia or some uh, infection at the hospital. They're too weak to go home. Uh, not because they had a, you know, they're healthy and had knee surgery and went to these uh, facilities. So you don't want to catch a disease by going to a rehab facility uh, uh, if you don't have to. Uh, and there, there's research out there that have shown there's about a 15% chance you make, you know, get something unintended uh, if you uh, end up in a rehab facility. Um, okay, now in terms of, you know, your recovery, uh, most people need to use a walker, uh, somewhere between one to four weeks, uh, and then possibly a cane. So I told patients in general, six weeks of what, using a walker or and with, with plus or minus a cane, uh, uh, that's on average, uh, and then uh, you uh, are able to uh, uh, hopefully get off get, get off those uh, uh, devices after that. Unless, of course, you start off using a walker um, uh, before the surgery, in which case, you know, that may be still the safest thing to do or may take longer to get off that uh, device. Uh, the knee usually feels good uh, by three to four months, um, but it certainly can't take longer if you start off, again, physically challenged. 
So goals of, of total knee replacement, again, it's pain relief, right? You don't want to be this guy on the left-hand side, uh, or if you are this guy on the left-hand side, the idea is to make you into this guy on the right-hand side. So total knee replacement is the gold standard for knee osteoarthritis uh, when uh, the, all the conservative measures fail. It helps to address late stage osteoarthritis very well. And again, it's been proven uh, that long-term survivorship, in other words, how long you keep the implant, it's 90% out uh, 15 years. And it is considered one of the most successful procedures in orthopedics by far. So I wanna get, I wanna talk a little bit about what we actually do. And so traditional, uh, as opposed to what we're doing uh, currently at St. Joseph's and what I'm doing currently, traditional knee replacement surgery, uh, it was like a uh, carpenter's tool, uh, or, or I call it a fine cabinet maker's toolbox. Now a lot of tools that we have to use, widgets and, and, and gadgets in order to do the surgery properly. So this is a de depiction of what happens with the femur. So we have to use these tools and we have to pin them to the end of the bone. Uh, and we use some uh, measuring devices, sophisticated measuring devices to measure uh, where the uh, bone cuts need to be. Uh, and this is a up close uh, 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 vision of, we call this the cutting block. We got them pinned into here. So then we use a saw and we you know, cut the knee based on all these measurements we made during surgery. And the, for the tibia, similarly, we uh, use this uh, long rod that we kind of uh, attach uh, to the knee. Uh, it's a clamp that goes around the ankle, not into the bone. But then we have to somewhat use our eyes to make sure that this is uh, parallel to the, to the leg. Uh, and we have to kind of use some uh, rulers and such to make sure that our depth is good. And, and for the most part, this really works, okay? There's nothing wrong with it. It does work. Okay, and this is kind of an up close and uh, a view of what happens when we do the surgery in this manner. So when it, it, our cuts are made, this is what we end up having, all right? This picture on the left-hand side. There are some patients that ask me, oh, I thought you're supposed to cut the bone up here and then also down here. And I, 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 I like to tell them, no, no, we don't remove the whole knee. You know, we just cut the, the knee in certain parts. We try to preserve as much bone as possible. In other words, we kind of make these, uh, uh, angled cuts on the top upper bone. Uh, we, sh we cut away basically a quarter inch, you know, in, in various areas to so block it off. And then on the bottom tibia bone, we cut off maybe three eighths or half an inch. And then we have the, uh, this piece of metal that we actually cement on here. Cement is, uh, uh, it's, it's basically a material uh, that looks like your uh, caulking material that you may use in the bathroom or uh, um, in the shower. And we it's kind of like a putty. We put it on here and then we uh, put the uh, implant on there and we kind of hold it there until the cement hardens. And then similarly in the bottom portion, do the same thing for the metal portion. Uh, hardens in about 15 minutes. And then uh, we choose a uh, piece of plastic that goes in between. Now the plastic comes in different uh, thicknesses so we can uh, see how tight or how loose the knee needs to be. And obviously these implants, uh, you know, they come in different sizes, uh, uh, depending on how big the person is. Now, that's the uh, traditional way of doing a knee replacement, which I still do uh, in certain cases. But what we have evolved to is using computer or robotic technology uh, to help us uh, do, do the surgery. Now, uh, at St. Joseph, we have this uh, uh, nice machine. We call it the Stryker Mako Robot, okay? Um, and this is a big old fat arm that's right here. And at the end of the arm, as you can see, there's a saw, okay? Now, having said that, uh, the robot does not do the surgery. I still have to pull the trigger on the saw, and I still have to make calculations. So the robot doesn't do the surgery without me actually controlling the end of the, uh, the business end of the machine. So just be aware. All right. This is kind of our general setup. We have a robot. We have uh, a couple of computer stations. We have a camera, uh, and I'm able to adjust uh, how the cuts are made based on the computer, uh, uh, right in the middle of surgery, to decide where the where's the best angle and where's the best location to cut the bone to get a nice balanced knee. And uh, so, before I do any kind of cutting, you know, I'm looking at the knee uh, as the, usually when if you're the patient as you're going to sleep. Uh, we get what's called a CAT scan. A CAT scan is a fancy x-ray that shows every single detail of the bone. So each individual bone, a person's bone is different, right? Uh, some uh, person may have a, a, a larger uh, bump here called the Lister's tubercle versus someone else. 
uh, and the CT scan really images uh, the bone in 3D uh, and we could really get uh, exact sizing of what the uh, uh, your bone is and based on that we could then uh, simulate where the knee prosthesis needs to go for your, uh, each individual person. We could you know turn it uh, a degree or even 0.1 degree one way or another uh, we could uh, uh, lift one side up uh, by 0.1 millimeters uh, up and down to really dial in exactly where the best fit is for your the uh, prosthesis when we actually uh, are ready to uh, uh, put it in. So based on that, uh, the computer helps us tell us where the cuts should be. Okay, so we dial this in before we do any kind of cutting. So we put the uh, template, the implant, uh, simulate it on the computer screen. So, okay, based on this, the cut needs to be here or there, okay, which we cannot do uh, uh, using the, the gadgets and widgets this accurately. Um, so what happens? So when someone asked me one time, so how does the robot uh, uh, computer uh, know where the, uh, the knee is, uh, where the bone is in space? Well, when you're asleep, my the incision obviously goes right down the middle here, but we do put pins in to the bone and we attach these uh, antenna. We call them arrays, like a radar. Okay, and based on this, uh, there's one that goes up on the femur bone, one goes on the tibia bone. Uh, the computer or the robot knows exactly where this bone is and where every little nook and cranny is in space. Now, there's a way to uh, we call it mapping it out, but once we it's a ten minute, it's a no, five minute procedure to to kind of point to different areas to make sure that. If I'm pointing on one spot, one bump, it, it coordinates with that one bump on the computer, but it's very accurate. So once we do that uh, with this new uh, uh, computerized technology, again, before making any cuts, we could simulate uh, where the uh, implant is supposed to fit. And uh, uh, once we got the tissues open, we could see if we put it in a certain position, you know, will it be straight? Will it still be, you know, crooked? You know, and we could. Uh, uh, maneuver the uh, knee joint and push this bone one way or the other and see, you know, where the exact balance is. And based on these uh, 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 <clears throat> um, uh, measurements, we could then adjust exactly where the, uh, where we want the cuts to go such that the implant is uh, put in straight, so to speak. And then, you know, instead of having this trapezoidal uh, picture uh, of, uh, of where the, uh, the cuts are, we end up on this, as, as in this uh, right-hand screen, we want a nice rectangle there, which means that all this tension on the outside and inside are all balanced appropriately. That's what you won't want to have a, a good result. Now, again, uh, most of the time, this can be done with the manual technique, uh, but uh, certainly there's a lot more accuracy involved uh, and precision when you use the computer robot. So here's an example of the, uh, this is a model of what the setup looks like. See this big, old, big arm here, okay? Keep that in mind. That's the robot's arm, and here's the uh, saw that's uh, at the at the uh, end of it. Now, as opposed to um, the traditional methods, as you can see, there's nothing pinned onto the bone, right? So this is a sample of uh, this is an example of someone uh, working on a model here, where um, uh, all we got to do is so the robot knows where to make the bone cuts. Okay. So uh, what happens is that if uh, this person tries to uh, turn the saw in a different uh, angle. Not only does the saw stop, but because of this heavy arm, you can't you can't forcibly move this thing in that direction. So the robot basically dictates where you're going to make the bone cuts. And the left hand picture is a live picture of you know how we actually do it in surgery. You can see there are no uh, widgets and stuff besides the uh, uh, radar, uh, the uh, uh, ray that's attached to the bone above, and there's one below here. Uh, we don't have any other uh, devices uh, or, or, or tools that we use to uh, cut the bone with. And it's very accurate. So this is what happens. This is what I see on the screen when I do the surgery. Uh, everything is green where I need to cut away. So uh, as I move the saw, I can see the saw actually start moving in. And then my, when I start making the cut, uh, I can see that the uh, green turns into white. And then once I cut through, um, then everything turns white and you, 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 you know you cut that piece of bone uh, off. Uh, this is the, the, the depiction of the tibia in a similar fashion. You can see this has just started. We, start to just, we just start to make the cut here and you can see that as the saw goes through the bone uh, this much, this, and this is what's shown on the picture, this is how far we've gone. And not only that, 
this green outline here tells you the limits of the saw. In other words, if you try to push the saw past here, the, the robot arm won't let me go over here. So it helps to also protect the tissues uh, and you know, not allow me to cut the ligaments and other things you know, inadvertently. Obviously, things can you know, happen, but uh, in general, this is a, 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 a safety uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the robot as well. We do still protect the proper tissues like we always do in the other, uh, in the other way, but it's not a freehand cut. So again, whether you use a robot or whether you use the old fashioned manual techniques, you still end up with something that looks like this. The cuts are very similar. Um, um, and uh, we still cement the implant in afterwards. And then uh, uh, we close you up and, and there you are. Now here's an example of a before and after. This is, a, this is the hip up here and the ankles down here. And you can see this person's leg is the left leg. You can see how the knee kind of uh, bends or the uh, uh, leg bends inward, okay? This is beforehand. This is a side view of the uh, knee. And afterwards, with the uh, after surgery, you can see that the leg is fairly straight, okay? The top bone, femur bone, knee bone are pretty much uh, parallel in one plane. And the side view, this is what the uh, implant looks like on an x-ray. So, um, I feel that you know computer robotic technology for knee replacement is here to stay. Uh, it's been around uh, starting with partial knee replacements all oh, about uh, eight to almost ten years ago, and the technology for doing total knee replacements uh, just started. I would say about two years ago, and uh, two or three years ago. And um, um, St. Joseph has graciously been uh, uh, able to adopt this technology, so uh, we do use it. Uh, uh, in most patients. And so I think that uh, having this nice precision uh, of, of doing a surgery is here to stay. Again, the robot does not do the cutting. I still have to you know, manipulate the saw to do the cutting as opposed to other robotic technology. Uh, but it certainly makes the cuts and component placement more accurate than using the old, uh, um, um, uh, the, the older technique without using the robot. And certainly it is very useful to eliminate the outliers. Even with a traditional method, I think most patients still do well, but uh, you know, if you could eliminate the people that, uh, whose knees come out looking a little crooked, although that's not the intent, uh, it certainly eliminates those outliers. Um, but we'll have to see in the future whether um, if patient satisfaction is as good or better uh, than using the traditional methods. The, the, the jury's still not out yet. There are still some naysayers saying that it, you know, they feel they could do a, a knee replacement as good as uh, 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 using the robot or not using the robot. So um, that maybe that still may be true. And then we'll, this is the, this is the really uh, 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 question, this is the real question we need to answer uh, uh, in the long term because we feel that we could put the components in more accurately or to each person, will these knee replacement last longer? Um, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, um, imperfection that your body can take, and we still don't know what that is uh, when we do it in a, using a manual technique. But with the uh, uh, robotic technique, we know that uh, uh, we're putting it in uh, uh, as accurately as more accurately as possible, and we'll see if uh, in 20 years, you know, uh, you know, if these knees. Oh, uh, I would hold up even, you know, even longer, 30 years or, or more. So um, I think that's my last slide. And uh, thank you very much for uh, joining me on this uh, presentation. And I guess we'll start taking questions. If anybody has any questions, you can type them in the chat and I'll, I'll read some questions that came in um, prior to the um, event tonight. You had mentioned partial knee replacement for the Mako, and a, a question came in that was asking about partial knee replacement. Partial knee replacement when it's preferred over total knee, or how would you make a decision if to do a partial or a total? That's a good question. Yeah, I didn't get into the partial knee replacement for the sake of time, uh, but that depends on uh, uh, how arthritic your knee is. Um, Arthritis is a spectrum, you know, from uh, the x-rays looking worse uh, 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 or not as bad until it gets really bad. You can grade it on a scale of zero to, zero to 10, if you will. Uh, part of that, uh, most of that depends on what part of the knee is arthritic. Uh, usually it's the inner part of the knee. That's where always the pain, if, that, if that's exclusively where your pain is, 
and the x-rays show that and it, and, the, and if the x-rays also show that your arthritis is not extremely severe, then it is possible you may be a candidate for having a partial knee replacement. Um, in my hands, uh, I use x-ray as a, a judgment. Uh, sometimes this is where I may get an MRI to get some of the finer things out to see whether or not uh, uh, the other uh, uh, parts of the knee are as arthritic or not. Um, but um, a lot of doctors don't do this a partial knee replacement because again, the studies have not borne out, uh, uh, again, without using the, the robot, studies have not borne out whether they're uh, really uh, uh, effective in the long term. But like I said, with the, uh, in my experience, uh, I've done this uh, probably for the last seven years. Um, I've had one person that had to convert, only that, that person had to, had to be converted because that person fell, uh, injured it, and did something to her knee. But besides beside that, everyone else who I've done partial knee replacement have held up. So we'll see uh, how long they last for. Uh, traditionally, using traditional tools and traditional methods, uh, we used to tell people it, it, it'll last you uh, uh, about seven to eight years, 50% of the time. But I think with the robotic technology, partial knees are lasting longer. Uh, now, but you know, we don't have the data to say definitively, oh yeah, you know, uh, it, it will last you 15, 20 years or longer. But again, it, it depends on the degree of arthritis you have in your knee. Um, question, uh, a patient had a defibr defibrillator placed a couple years ago and is due for an ablation surgery. Um, would they be a candidate for knee replacement surgery? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, that's up to the heart doctor, the cardiologist. Uh, if the cardiologist feels that uh, they're safe to have surgery, then it's, it's not a problem. Uh, uh, piggybacking on that, a lot of patients ask the question, am I too old to have surgery? So I told my patients, uh, age is, 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 is one small factor. It's not really how old you are, it's how healthy you are. That's what counts more than anything else. You could be 60 years old and have a bad heart, have asthma, and have diabetes, and you may not be a good candidate for surgery versus someone you could be 90 years old. Uh, the oldest patient I've done a knee replacement on is probably 94. You know, uh, he had just a little bit of high blood pressure. He still walked every day, was gardening in his backyard, uh, and his knee was, you know, uh, shot. So we did a knee replacement. He did well. Okay. Um, what reasons would you not use the robot if you were evaluating a patient? Why would you not use Mako? Uh, that's another good question. Um, uh, for me, uh, sometimes it depends on the complexity of the surgery. Uh, you know, there's a certain limit as to what the, we could do with the robot, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, I am of a, I would say a, a minority of surgeons that believe in what's called metal allergies. Um, that's a topic that is controversial in the orthopedic world. Uh, some people uh, don't believe in it, uh, although I became a believer when I had a patient that actually was truly allergic to the type of metal. Um, and uh, uh, the biggest culprit tends to be nickel. Uh, nickel is a part of the component that is in the metal. The metal is an alloy, means that it's not just one type of metal uh, that the implant is made up of. It looks like a chrome bumper normally. And one of the uh, uh, metals in there in a small quantity is nickel. There is a large percentage, of, well, I won't say large, uh, studies have shown uh, 10 to 15 percent of the population is allergic, allergic to nickel in a certain way. Um, and um, I had the unfortunate experience where I had a, a, a patient get a, a reaction and the reaction was uh, the knee hurt after I put it in, uh, the knee swelled up and it was bothering them uh, a lot. Uh, and sometimes you don't know if an infection can look like that too. After a lot of tests and stuff like that, I did what's called a redo, a revision. He did well. I tested him for nickel allergy and he was very allergic to nickel. And then my conclusion is, was that he had a nickel allergy. Uh, so in those situations, uh, the company that, uh, uh, um, uh, the robot manufacturers, the, the company that manufactures the robots, excuse me, um, doesn't have a nickel-free product. There are a couple of uh, 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 companies that do per, uh, offer uh, components that are nickel-free. And in that situation, I will uh, use those uh, 
company's products uh, in order to do the knee replacement. All right, thank you. Um, are there exercises um, that are recommended for osteoarthritis of the knee? Yes, I believe I alluded to that a little bit in one of my slides. Uh, in general, we call low impact activities. Low impact means no jumping, you know, no you know, running, nothing where you're pounding. Uh, and uh, it, it obviously depends on the degree of arthritis you, ha you have, but uh, good ex walking in general is a good exercise. For example, if you want to do a little bit more uh, uh, bicycling, uh, going on a treadmill, swimming, uh, are all good exercises. Um, and this is similar, similar, but how does running affect the knee? So assuming you don't actually have something, is running bad for your knees maybe? Uh, so uh, that's sort of a philosophical issue. I would say that in general, running is probably uh, not good for your knees uh, because you know, you're pounding. Uh, people that are athletes and runners Yes, uh, I think there's a higher chance of wear and tear. Uh, I'm not going to tell patients to stop running uh, because that's their passion, right? And, you know, life is all about risks, you know, uh, risks and benefits and weighing the good and the bad. Uh, but certainly uh, if, if someone is uh, apt to get arthritis and there's some genetic predisposition, if, if you are from a family where you had, oh, I have had three aunts and uncles that had knee replacement surgery, and I've had my grandfather and my grandmother all had knee replacement surgery. My parents are, are at a point where uh, they may get knee replacement surgery. It, it, then, you know, you may want to think twice about being a runner uh, because there's a high chance that you may end up having knee arthritis just from general wear and tear. But uh, anything that's high impact, uh, certainly, uh, including running, potentially can uh, increase your risk of having arthritis. Okay. How many robotic surgeries have you performed in the last two years? Uh, that's a good number. Uh, good question. So the total knee replacements we just started this year. So uh, I, uh, but uh, I use that application also for partials and for hips. Uh, I would say uh, you know, in a given year, I would say mm, maybe about 40 a year, 40 to 50 a year. Okay. Uh, how soon after surgery do patients usually return to work? Well, that depends on what kind of work it is. Obviously, if you're a um, uh, office type worker, uh, where you're able to sit in front of a computer, you probably could do that in, you know, uh, I would say within a month. Uh, if you're a uh, 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 someone that has a more of a physical job, you know, that could take four to six months. If you're like working in a uh, um, department store or a clerk or something like that, it may take you three months. You know, er, er, it depends on the, the, how, how strenuous the uh, job is. Okay. Um, are there benefits of fish capsules on arthritis or other supplemental type products? That's a good question. Uh, as far as I know, fish oil and stuff, I'm not sure of. And there are many supplements out there that people rave over. The only one that I have, uh, uh, there's some uh, studies out there uh, is glucosamine with chondroitin. Uh, it's a, uh, a supplement that's available that uh, uh, you could try. Um, we still don't know how that works uh, uh, from a scientific point of view, but some people do get some relief uh, with that supplement. Uh, my only uh, caution is, you know, they tend to be expensive, but if you're going to try it, you got to try it for a good four to six weeks. If it doesn't help you by four to six weeks, then it's probably not worth the money to pay for it. Okay. I think that's the majority of the questions since we're now a little after seven. Um, I posted earlier um, the phone number to our orthoped orthopedic patient. Okay, I mean, well, one, one comment is a comment yeah. about, you know, reducing inflammation. I mean, some of the more natural stuff that people are using uh, uh, that's caught on, uh, uh, turmeric, the turmeric uh, capsules or, or powder, and that's, just, that's a natural uh, occurring, um, you know, med, uh, supplement or uh, natural including, uh, I think, uh, plant. Turmeric uh, tends to, you know, decrease inflammation in, in general and maybe benefit. Some people swear by it. And again, you know, there's nothing that's research has proven, 
but uh, that's something that's fairly safe, I think, if you try. What about uh, collagen? That one just popped up. Collagen. Uh, I guess that depends on what the... Uh, 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 I'm, I'm not sure if collagen itself, uh, and I haven't seen that as a supplement to take, whether or not it's going to help the... Uh, 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 knee joint or any joint or not. Um, you know, there are a lot of supplements out there that may help, uh, although nothing's really proven uh, to help. You know, there's a lot of uh, people out to make money on various different supplements. And, you know, if it works for you, great, you know. Uh, but if, you know, it's, it's not something that if you do a research and you give a thousand people this supplement that you're going to have, uh, there's nothing out there I could tell you well that 900 people are going to get relief from. Those are the ones that are, you know, the medications I talked about, such as the ibuprofen and the uh, naproxens, if you're able to tolerate those such medications. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I put the number in there for our Ortho Navigator at St. Joe's, and you can um, contact Dr. Kawaguchi at Alpine Orthopedics.